In this video, we're going to continue our discussion on mobile application development considerations. We're going to look in depth at what an IDE is, what an integrated development environment is, uh, what an emulator is, and we're going to compare and contrast some of the popular application or uh, uh, mobile operating systems of today. So, in the last video, we looked at uh, steps in, in creating a mobile app, uh, deciding the concept, deciding where you're going to get data, how you're going to combine data, looking at a storyboard, considering devices to support, uh, deployment, and support. And in this video, we're going to pick up with the integrated development environment. So what is an integrated development environment? It's a place where you can write your program. So you write the program, the source code, the logic, how things come together. You integrate any resources that you need, which might be images or sounds or maybe third-party libraries. You can compile the program, which means put it all together in one nice package that can be deployed. You can run the program in what's called an emulator, and you can debug the program. So, for instance, I have uh, my application, which we looked at in the last video. Uh, my application is Plant Places Mobile. We've been looking at it here in this emulator. Now, an emulator is nice because you can bring an application up in something that acts like a phone. And you can do it relatively quickly without actually having the phone with you, or without actually having the phone connected. And that's why in my Android application classes, I often say that you don't need an Android phone to be enrolled in the class. All you need is a computer with the emulator, and I can help you to get that emulator set up. So, uh, as a matter of fact, the first few times I taught the Android course, I myself didn't have an Android phone. I simply used the emulator on my computer. So an emulator is something that looks and feels like a phone, but it's running on your development computer, maybe a PC or a laptop or a Mac or whatever you use to develop. An emulator is a piece of software on that PC that looks and feels like a phone. And this is something that's provided to us as part of the development environment. This is especially important for Android developers. Because if we look at iOS, we realize what devices can iPhone apps run on. Well, they can run on iPhones, and there are only a certain number of versions of hardware that iPhones are. You have, you know, the 3, the 4, and the 5, uh, and they're all made by Apple. In Android, anybody can make an Android device, and many different people do, many different manufacturers do. LG, Motorola, Samsung many manufacturers make them. So we have to consider those differences in hardware, differences in screen size, and that's where emulators are nice. We can test on our own phone and maybe a limited number of hardware devices that we have, but then we can use emulators to look at what the app is going to look like in other devices. To be honest, if you go back about a year ago, the Android emulator was painfully slow. Uh, and hard to use. There is a little shortcut if you're on an Intel-based computer called Intel HAXM. If you do do any Android development, I have a separate video that discusses how to set that up. Uh, I'm running, this is the Intel HAXM emulator, and it's a very fast option. It's a very fast option to have if you are using an emulator. In the old days, it would take sometimes 15 or 20 minutes to load up an emulator, get it running. It took a very long time. So, this is the emulator, and we also have the IDE, which I promised to talk about. So, this is the development environment. Right now, it's in debug mode, because what I can do is I can walk through different features in my app, like the search by color. I can set a breakpoint, and I can watch the code run, and I can step through it one line at a time. I can look for bugs. This is really important when we're doing application development uh, because we want to be able to replicate things that are happening on the actual phone. Okay, so if I go over, I uh, go to Java View. This is the live and running plantplaces.com app. This is exactly the app that you would see on the Google Play Store right now. This is the source code behind it. Okay, so if we take a look, and what we have, we have a little directory structure that tells us uh, what we can do. 
and where we put our files that tell us what the app does, our resources, our images, and things like that. We have an editor window over on the right, and that editor window is where we actually write the code that makes our app function. So for example, the algorithm that goes through and indexes a photo or a camera image and picks the top 16 colors, that's all written as source code, which is what we see here in the IDE. So we can write the program, we can run the program in the emulator, and we can also debug the program. All of these things are things that are very helpful as, as a developer, okay, things that we want to do. So for Android, uh, we typically use Eclipse, or we can use something called the Android SDK, which is a standalone development environment. Or we can use uh, something called IntelliJ IDEA. Uh, for iPhone, you'll typ typically use an IDE called Xcode. Xcode, to my knowledge, only runs on a Mac. So you do have to have a Mac. Where with Android, uh, Eclipse will run on anything that runs Java, which would be a Mac, a PC, Linux, Unix, anything like that. Um, you know, so, so, so some pluses and minuses, depending on which platform you like. And there are definitely advantages to doing iPhone development. There are disadvantages to doing iPhone development. There are advantages to doing Android and disadvantages to doing Android development. It all depends on uh, what you want to do, what your audience is. If you want to write a Windows Phone app, the application to use is called Visual Studio. And we'll look at that in a later video. Uh, a lot of people are very familiar with the Microsoft framework and very familiar with the Visual Studio environment. Now, similar to Xcode, Visual Studio, uh, you have to use on a Windows machine. Uh, so now you can have Macs that, that uh, run Windows, so uh, you can certainly run it on a Mac in that case, but you have to develop this on a Windows machine. Uh, Visual Studio does have a license fee as well, but uh, usually students can get Visual Studio for free, and you can also get their, um, uh, the name of it escapes me at the moment, but they have uh, single versions of Visual Studio, things that do one function, like Community Edition, that you can often get for free as well. Uh, one thing I will say, there's something called Cordova, uh, or PhoneGap, and there are several other options like this out in the market right now, where the idea is you write an app one time, and then you can compile it for each platform, for iPhone, for Android, for uh, Windows Phone. Uh, and so these are pretty popular because they take away that problem of you have to write an app multiple times. I have used uh, Cordova in Eclipse, and I've also used it in Visual Studio, and it definitely works in both places. I will tell you I found it very easy to use in Visual Studio. Uh, so if you're doing any kind of Windows Phone development or cross-platform development, Visual Studio might be a good option to consider. Might be a good one to consider to at least do a first build of the application, and then you can always to, uh, go to other environments like Eclipse and then build it for Android, go to Xcode, build it for iOS. Okay, one of the other things that the IDE will do for us is package our program to be distributed. So if I go up here to Plant Places Android, right click, and this will be a little bit off screen, but I go to Android Tools and then Export Signed Application Package, what that's going to do if I click on it, that's going to create something called an APK. And the APK is the distributable version of software. It's the entire compiled version of the software. So I'm not going to go all the way through this, uh, but I'll do the first steps in. Okay, I first have to sign it, which means this is my application. I'm assuring who I am. Okay, and you see what it's eventually going to create is something called Plant Places Android APK. This makes me a little bit nervous because this is the file that I actually upload to the Play Store. In a previous video, I showed a little bit around the back end of the Play Store and the kind of things that we can look at. Um, one of the things that we have is this APK. And if I want to release a new version of my app, I choose Upload New APK. And then I upload the file that I, I upload the file here that I created back in Eclipse. Okay, I upload the file that I created in Eclipse here. 
And then for Android, it's released to the public pretty quickly after that. There's not a big turnaround time. Uh, it is a bit longer. There is a different process for iPhone. They have some uh, code reviews and quality checks that they go through. Uh, where for Android, it's pretty much community-based. It's based on your ratings and things like that. Uh, an app that is not well written will quickly get low quality ratings and probably not a whole lot of downloads. Uh, so, the Android app will get released pretty quickly. You can see the history of apps that I've released. Um, version 2 on February 2nd was the very first version. I made some significant improvements and then released another version and then actually found some bugs that I fixed right away. Uh, so 3, 4, and 5 were very close. Version 6 uh, September of 2013 had some usability improvements that I discussed in the last video. Uh, things like using the image gallery to pick an image. Uh, things like uh, a, a better indexing of colors and a better view of search results where the search results actually show the matching images. So that was September 27th. I have one that's almost ready to get released. I'll probably have it released sometime this summer. So we'll have uh, another update this summer. But you see, even within a year, that's how frequent the releases were, which honestly wasn't very frequent. I probably could have done a lot more releases than that if I wanted. But in any case, the IDE will build this APK, and the APK is what we upload and we put on the Play Store. While I'm here, one other thing I wanted to point out. I mentioned for Android, you have a lot of different devices that you need to support. If I click on Device, it actually shows who has my app. It shows what the most common devices are, so I kind of have an idea of how I need to tune my app the best. You know, what are the most common devices? Samsung, uh, Motorola, Samsung. So we have lots of Galaxy, the Razer. Uh, my own phone isn't here, which is kind of curious, the LG G2, uh, which I like quite a bit. I like my phone quite a bit. But um, anyway, you see quite a big distribution of different hardware manufacturers. So this is something we have to consider when we are making our app. We have to think about the different devices it could be on. We have to think about what emulators we can use to emulate those devices. We also have to think of our friends and other places where we can get this device, uh, or friends who can help us test on their own device, especially friends who might have a different device than we have. Uh, so the more actual hardware you can use, the better. When you, have a, when you have some old hardware, when you get a new phone, save your old phone. Use it as a testing device. Uh, probably a good idea. Okay, so uh, emulator we talked about allows you to test and debug your applications. We talked through this slide. Programming languages. If we go back in the history of mobile, uh, believe it or not, things change pretty frequently. Uh, if we go pre-iPhone, it used to be that BlackBerry was very common. Now BlackBerry is a distant third or fourth. Windows Phone used to also be uh, very popular. Now that's gone uh, to a distant third or fourth. Nokia and their Symbian operating system used to be 48% of the market. Uh, now that's down to the low single digits. So what do these different operating systems use? A lot of them use some variant of Java. Okay. Nokia, which is Symbian, which you don't, you know, don't see a lot of anymore. Nokia has kind of gone the way of Windows Phone. Uh, Nokia was one of the most pure Java implementations. And by pure, I mean they didn't have a lot of extensions to it. Uh, so you could write an app for a Nokia phone and run it on a different phone, different operating system. Uh, it was very pure and honestly very easy to use. So it's kind of a shame we don't see that much anymore. BlackBerry also had a very standard Java development environment with some BlackBerry extensions that made it more specific to BlackBerry. But nonetheless, it used a lot of libraries uh, that were just common Java libraries. Android is Java-based, but it's not pure Java ME. So where Nokia and BlackBerry are more pure Java, Android is Java-based, but it doesn't compile the same way that most Java programs compile. It's very Android specific. Uh, that being said, it's also um, very common now. So Android's kind of become very popular, uh, but it is a bit of a customized development, uh, Java development environment. iPhone is something called Objective C. Uh, Objective C, you need that Xcode IDE, and you need a Mac for that. 
Okay, so again, that's a, one of the reasons why my app is on Android is just for the simple reason that I don't own a Mac. Nothing against iPhones. I just don't have a development environment that I can use to write. Now, I could maybe, um, you know, use the university's labs or something like that, but uh, honestly, the, the, the majority of code I've written for my own app has happened in an airport or on an airplane or on a cruise ship. Uh, times when I have my laptop with me and oftentimes don't have an internet connection. So it's just based on the hardware that I have. That was the easiest app for me to write. Okay. Windows Phone uses C Sharp, which is a Windows uh, specific programming language. Then we have this thing called Cordova or PhoneGap. I'm curious to see how this takes off because it's a nice uh, way to kind of get into programming for mobile phones if you have a web development background, uh, which is somewhat common. It's multi-platform. It's HTML plus JavaScript. So what you do is you write the core of the application and then you compile it for a specific platform uh, for Android or for iPhone or for Windows or for anything else. Uh, it, it's kind of one level of, of abstraction away from a natively written app. So you don't get, uh, to my knowledge, you don't get all of the native functionality that you would get uh, if you wrote an app specifically for one platform. But it's a very, uh, a very good value proposition and something that we're seeing grow a lot. There's a lot more interest in this Cordova and Phone Gap. Uh, so uh, we'll see where that goes. Uh, a lot of reuse there. Uh, it might finally solve the issue where you have to write an app for each platform. We can also use skills that aren't really programming specific. Uh, you know, a lot of people have these HTML and JavaScript skills. If we can lower the barriers to entry for writing apps, we'll probably see a lot more good apps out there. Okay, so platforms, uh, you know, I come from an Android background, but again, that, you know, I don't mean to be prejudiced either way. Both Android and iOS and all the others have a lot of advantages and disadvantages. The iOS crowd is a tech-savvy crowd. There are a lot of people who have iPhones, and people with iPhones tend to like apps and tend to uh, be used to looking at apps and paying for apps and knowing where to find apps and assuming that there is an app available for what they want to do. Uh, the only trick is it does require a Mac to develop, as we've said before. Android also a tech-savvy crowd and a large user base. Uh, the flip side is you do have to plan for all of these different devices uh, and all of these different versions. So, uh, you know, with iPhone, an advantage is that you have a very standard piece of hardware with a very standard shape. It's easy to make peripherals for it because there's only one shape. There's only one set of dimensions. It's easy to write apps for it because you know exactly what the resolution is. Android? Lots of different devices. Those devices have different shapes, different dimensions. Uh, it's a little harder to make peripherals for them. Okay, so that's something to consider. Both the iOS and Android marketplaces are saturated with apps right now. So uh, there are plenty of, you know, whatever your idea is, there's probably somebody who's done something very similar. To-do lists, see this quite a bit. So you have to do something uh, special to stand out. Now, if you look beyond the big two, uh, there's a lot of market available. One of the complaints of people on Windows Phone, who I know, is the lack of apps in the marketplace. So there's a smaller user base, but there's not much competition. So if you are thinking of Cordova, uh, an easy way to get into Cordova is with Visual Studio, the IDE we use for Windows, and you might find that you don't have a lot of competition there. It might be a very uh, interesting place to start your app out and see how it does. And then because you've written it with Cordova, uh, if you like the app, then you can do builds for the other uh, for the other phones as well. Something worth thinking about. What's the cost to deploy? Uh, I looked these numbers up about a year ago, so if anybody has any corrections here, let me know. For iOS, uh, you're looking at a developer license of about $99 a year. For Android, you pay $25 one time to the Google Play Store uh, to, get a, to get a developer license for the Google Play Store. That's a one-time fee. Here again, for my own app, I'm giving it away. Uh, I wanted to reduce the recurring costs that I had. $25 one time is something I could deal with. $100, I wasn't sure if I could really make that much in ad revenue or any 
ancillary revenue in a, in a year to cover it. And what happens 10 years from now? Do I want to keep paying for something that maybe I'm no longer really supporting anymore? Uh, a $25 one-time fee sounded a little bit better to me. But there again, uh, you know, there are trade-offs here. Uh, you, If you have a Mac, if you have an iPhone, uh, the $99 a year might be a well worthwhile purchase uh, because you know you have that stability of the uh, the limited hardware and, and um, you know, the, the given audience, the given resolution that you're going to have. All things to consider. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. I wanted to look a little bit more at what we have in the IDE itself. Uh, and for this example, again, I'm going to use my own app. First of all, we have some third-party jars that we're bringing in, things like the Google Maps uh, and the Android supporting packages. I have the source code. If you take a look here, the source code is broken down uh, into several layers, and there are a lot of classes here, just because my app does a lot of different things. If I had it to do over again, I would probably limit that functionality. Instead of giving maybe five or ten different things that the user can do, I'd just pick maybe one or two that I could do really well. Uh, you know, that's one thing. I think I put too much into the app. I think I put too many features in and maybe overwhelm the user probably be best to step back and just focus on the things the user's going to use. And that's hard to do. A lot of times you want to do things, you want to add more features in, uh, but you have to consider, will this actually be used or will it be a distraction? So first of all, there are all of the classes that make up the user interface. Then there are some of these, what I call classes, these little Java files that make up persistence. So speaking with data on the phone, speaking with data across the network, okay? And then some classes that do integration, integration with things like the camera, okay? Now, when I compile, it goes into this, uh, it, it generates certain things and put this, puts them into this gen folder, okay? A few more dependencies and libraries that I have. Then we have a configuration file called the Android Manifest. This specifies things like what version of the app am I currently on, okay? Uh, bin directory, remember that APK? There's that APK file, the compiled file, that's what we distribute out on the Google Play Store. Okay, any libraries that we're using, like the support library. One thing I really do want to point out here is this uh, resources directory, and what you'll see are some very interesting things. First of all, take a look at values, take a look at this file called strings XML. If you look at this, you're going to see string name equals and then a value. String name equals and then a name and a value. String name, a name, and a value. Notice all of these are English. Okay. Now let's go to values ES. You see a file with the same name, strings XML. Okay. And you see name and value, name and value. You might notice that the names are the same. Okay, the names are the same here. Let me actually get those scrolled at the same position. So we have app name, logon title, username, password. App name, logon title, username, password. But the values are different. And what's different about the values? Okay. Notice that these values are Spanish and these values are English. Okay. So you see a difference here between the English and the Spanish. Okay. Now, if a user says my language preference is Spanish, the user will get the Spanish strings XML. If the user prefers English or doesn't have a default, the user will get the English strings XML. So, remember what I said about country distribution? You might find that you have less competition if you go outside of the United States, so don't be afraid to do that. If you look at the, at the competition for plant places, there's Floridata, Dave's Garden, the Missouri Botanical Gardens, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, so, these might be some very U.S.-focused websites, U.S.-focused apps. When I go out uh, and I travel a lot for work, uh, a lot of times I will GPS botanical gardens wherever I am, especially if I'm in a different country or a different continent, because I want to, uh, I want to appeal to that other area. And if we look at the ad revenue for the Plant Places website, this is something that's always very interesting to me. It'll show where the ad revenue is coming from. Uh, so today, Germany, Germany, Portugal, and Romania, uh, those were significant sources of ad revenue in addition to the United States. United States was number two. 
I GPS several plants in Germany on several trips I had there. So that kind of stuff pays off. We also want to think about an app like Plant Places, which is seasonal. It's very seasonal in nature. March, April, May are going to be very busy months. Your app, is it going to get the same amount of users all year long? Or will it dip a little bit in the summer when people are outside? Will it pick up in the summer when people are outside? These are things to consider. Now again, with uh, geographic diversity, remember that our winter is somebody else's summer. Our fall is somebody else's spring. So you can try to get two peak seasons a year if you do appeal to a different audience. And if you're doing that, you want to consider string translations like this. You want to consider having supporting multiple languages. If I wanted to add French support, I'd add a values-fr, okay? And I'd add another strings XML. And then all I need to do is I need to translate this one file, okay? And I just translate the one file from one language to another. And then I have native support for that other language, okay? So, yeah, it looks like about 200 things I've translated here, and for me, I just use Google Translate. I'm not as, as fluent in Spanish as I would like. I know a little bit, but I'm not very fluent in it. Uh, you know, but I, it's worthwhile if you know someone fluent in another language to have them translate your app. We also have our layouts. These are all the screens. This is the XML that makes up the screens that we're looking at. And then we have this drawable LDPI MDPI and HDPI. This is something interesting to consider as well. Uh, let's take a look at drawing LDPI. I'm going to click on icon. Okay, a little icon there. Let me click on Favico. You see this one? Okay, that's the stylized P for plant places. Now I'm going to click on that same file in MDPI. And let's look at the difference. Okay, do you see a difference? between these two different files. Not a whole lot, but look closely. Do you see a difference between these two? Now let's go to HDPI. I'm going to click on Favico again. And now, do you see a difference across these three files? It's the same image, but scaled to be a different size. So, when we're writing an Android app or an iPhone app, what can it run on? A phone? tablet, a TV. You have your iPhone, your Android phone, your iPad, your Android tablet, Apple TV, Google TV. Resolution's very different. What you don't want to do is have only one icon like this, which is small, and then if the user watches the, is, uses your app on a, on a Google TV, look at that. See, when you just resize it, it pixelates, and it looks not very good, not very user-friendly, okay? It's better to actually have different copies that are created specifically for those resolutions. That'll be a much nicer app. So, uh, what do we have in our project? What do we have in our IDE? We have our supporting files, like our images and our icons. We have our layouts as XML. We have language translation. We have information about the application. We have the compiled APK file, uh, the file that we're ready to get uh, published. Okay, And then we have our source code. All of this is organized together in our IDE. In our IDE, we can write the program, debug the program, run the program, compile the program, and make a final build uh, to be deployed out to either the Apple uh, the Apple Store or the Google Play Store, depending on, or the Windows Store, whatever uh, store we happen to use. So the IDE is central to that. In this class, we're not going to get into a whole lot of programming, so that pretty much uh, sums up all we're going to talk about with an IDE in this class. But in the other classes as part of the certificate, the beginning iOS, beginning Android, advanced iOS, and advanced Android, it will get a little bit deeper into those languages. So uh, that's all I have for this lecture. Thanks for listening, and we'll have more to come.